Good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone has had an opportunity to sign up for our meet and greet and eat. That's on March 2nd at 6 p.m. Uh, if you have not received one and need to fill out one, please raise your hand. We have copy ushers in the back have copies of that, and you can fill that out and leave that in the offering plate. If you've already filled one out, we don't need another one. We've had several duplicates. Uh, I guess people are doing it every week. So, uh, you know, one is, is sufficient, but make sure you grab that and fill that out and then leave it in the offering plate when we take the offering. Looking forward to that. That's an exciting time. I know the search committee are excited, uh, very happy that we have a candidate. And so make sure that you have uh, that date in your calendar and also the third, uh, the service that Sunday. Please. Uh, Put that in your calendar and be here, and that's when we will uh, hear the sermon from our candidate and vote at the end of the service. Uh, our Easter musical is March 23rd, uh, so Sheila says to please come to uh, choir practice on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, if you are interested in being a part of the choir, uh, we need and we we could use some more uh, singers, and so I want you to be aware of that. And we look forward to having a great musical on the 23rd. Um, also, last announcement is uh, this evening uh, is the church conference. Uh, so we'll have important updates with, uh, I'm sure, from Pastor Search and uh, other areas in the church. Uh, so this evening will be uh, church conference at 6 p.m. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. We'll take up our offering. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, just another opportunity to worship you and to uh, gather together with uh, our church family. I just pray that you would just give us a, a love for one another. I just pray that you would uh, give Sandy's the, the word to preach as he uh, continues the, the series through Nehemiah, that you would continue to bring renewal uh, to this church and to this community. I pray for the offering that we would be good stewards of what you've given us, that you would uh, just help us to give glory to you and everything that we that we say and do. May you use this service to give glory and honor to you. Praise things in your name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I am glad to be here. How about you? There's a lot better, a lot worse places we could be than here. Amen. <laughs> so are you ready to sing? Yeah. All right. Matthew 7, 24 through 25. Some very familiar words. Therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine, and this is Jesus speaking, not Sheila, and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall, for that house had been built on the rock. And if you're a Baptist child like me, you're probably singing that song in your head, the wise man and the foolish man. But we're going to stand and sing on the Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let's stand and sing together. <clears throat> Oh. 
know it yet, but there's some pretty good people sitting around here, so why don't you speak to one of them and tell them they're in the right this morning. Good morning, sunshine. In Psalm 27, verse 1, we find these words written by the psalmist, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who should I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom should I dread? And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer sacrifices in his tent of joy. I will sing... Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Repeat that after me. I will sing. I will sing. Yes. 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 I will sing praises to the Lord. I will sing praises to the Lord. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? fills the night it cannot hide the light whom shall I fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall I fear whom shall Who 
like that, what are we afraid of? What are we worried about? What do we care about except Jesus? Amen? Amen. Amen. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the trust in him will never be put to shame. Jesus is the cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love, through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. composers wrote, my anchor holds within the veil. And in my weak mind, I thought, well, maybe it's the veil of the storm because a veil keeps us from seeing things. 
But what it means is that when Christ died and he tore through the veil in the temple, he was able to enter the Holy of Holies, not by the blood sacrifice of goats and of calves, but by his own blood. My anchor is Jesus, and as his child, he holds me in the Holy of Holies as his child. He is our cornerstone. He's all that matters. Everything else in this world is going to pass away. The building we're standing in today is going to eventually pass away. But Jesus is eternal. He's our cornerstone. And that is our focus as children of God, to share that message. So we're going to sing that chorus again. Johnny loves me when I do this. But think about, don't just sing the words, mean the words. Can you affirm that as your own faith today, that Christ is my cornerstone. And when all else passes away, the cornerstone will still be there. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. as your children you are our cornerstone that when we placed our faith and our trust in you as as our savior as our redeemer as our only way into the holy of holies that you became our foundation lord you are the solid rock on which we stand you are the god of angel armies who commands the host who will protect your children and you are our cornerstone. And one day you will return and create a new heaven and a new earth. And may we then in your righteousness be found. Lord, bless this service. Teach us what we do not know. Give us what we do not have, Lord. And show us what we cannot see. And it is in your son's precious name, O oh Jesus, we Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. How are you? I pray and hope and I know that you enjoyed my friend Dr. Michael Clower with you last week. I went back during the week and watched the message. What a powerful challenge uh, to be on mission and to focus us on the mission of God. Uh, when the Joshua asked me who I might would recommend to preach on Mission Sunday, uh, and I think you even recommended uh, Dr. Clower. Uh, I don't think uh, you could have found anybody with a more mission-minded heart and a love for the lost, especially those that have never heard the gospel. Uh, so just so glad he was able to share with you, with you last week. And I just can't tell you how excited I am for you. I read the little thing, the meet, the greet, and the eat. I love that. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, those are three of my favorite things to do. But I want you to know that I, I was thinking about how excited I am for you. It took me back to uh, think about Christmas time. At Christmas time at my house, a few days before Christmas, me and my wife would be sitting in the living room watching TV or something, and I would say to her, what did we get everybody? You know, Christmas is almost here. I, you know, I want to know what they have. You know, some presents I might know, but I got to confess to you, most of them, that's a shot in the dark. I don't really know in advance. So I asked that question, and then from there to Christmas, I'm excited for them because I know what they're getting. And, and I tell you that little bit of information because uh, as a church, I know what you guys are getting presented to you uh, for your candidate. 
uh, and his lovely wife to become your pastor. So I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the work that the Pastor Search Committee has done. I'm excited just how God has orchestrated this whole thing. And I do encourage you uh, to come and to meet and greet and eat And I can just confess to you, I've done all three of those, uh, and I am well satisfied with what God is bringing here for you guys. Super excited about the future. Now, let's shift gears a little bit and turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. I've confessed to you guys before that I I am not an elite athlete, but I think in terms of sports. That's just the way my mind works. Uh, And I remember in my Christian walk when I really began to understand what it was to really uh, think about the battle that we're in with the evil one. Uh, You know, I think we have to recognize that battle. I, I think we have to acknowledge that there is one that seeks to devour us. There is one that seeks to destroy your walk with Christ uh, and, and, and he has all types of, of ways he goes about that. And here's what we need to know about that evil one that seeks to devour you, is that he watches film on you. Now, what I mean by that is he knows how to attack you. You know, if I'm putting together as a coach a game plan, whether it's football, basketball, whatever, uh, baseball, I put together a game plan. You know, what are their weaknesses? Where, what do we need to be aware of? How do we need to go about attacking this other team in order to be successful? We have to know as believers that the evil one has done his homework on us. He knows your weaknesses. He knows where to attack you. He knows what, if you're a fisherman, he knows what bait to dangle out in front of you to get you to react. He studied you. He knows your temperament. He knows where you fall short. And so for us to be successful in that battle, we then have to do the same. We have to watch film on him. We have to understand how he works. And one of the great things about the book of Nehemiah is that we see, we have a front row seat. We've been watching film the last several weeks on how Satan works to distract us and draw us away from being renewed in our walk, first as an individual and secondly as a church. Because most everything that we talk through, there is a very individualistic application of it. But there's also a corporate part of it. Because as we walk together individually, we then come together and walk corporately as the body of Christ. So it's imperative that all of us understand and manage our walk with Christ. So that as the body, we're able to be what we are called to be. Amen? So as we look back into chapter 6 of Nehemiah, we're just going to look at the first, you know, 19 verses. Going to be short today. (laughs) That's a good place to laugh. So when we decide then to to live for Christ, we decide to, 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 to experience renewal maybe, or just commit ourselves to Christ for the first time, we got to know that the devil is going to use every weapon in his arsenal to derail us, to draw us away. And so as we look back in in Nehemiah, those first five chapters, Nehemiah, as he leads his people to rebuild the wall, we've seen weapons of Satan's external opposition. Satan has used those outside of the people of God. He's used the enemies that surround Jerusalem as uh, opposition to sort of derail what God is wanting to do through Nehemiah. So we've seen that external opposition. But also we've seen what? We, we've seen internal opposition. We've seen it in the form of dissension. We've seen it in the possibility of not some pagan outside of the walls of Jerusalem to, to lead the attack. But we've seen the potential of the attack being led from the inside. And so that's important for us to understand. Sometimes the opposition is external. Sometimes the opposition is internal. And so we've saw both of those. Now as, as the wall is, is being completed, the evil one again attacks, but he attacks this time with a little more sophisticated strategy. You know, that's why God gives us Ephesians chapter 6. You know, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 tells us to put on what? The whole armor of God. Don't put on a part of it. Because you're not going to be protected. Don't, don't just put on the upper body because you're going to be exposed with your lower extremities. Put on the whole armor 
of God so that what? So that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Or your translation may say the wiles of the devil. But that word that's translated schemes or, or wow there is, is where we get uh, our English word method. So put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the methods of, God, of, of the evil one. But in the Greek language, the word gives a little more pizzazz. Not only methods in the Greek, but it has that, it, it suggests this lying in wait this, this, it, it suggests this trickery. So put on the whole armor of God so that you might be able to stand against the trap that Satan has set for you or the trickery or the scheme that he's laid out for you. And in order to do that, we have to have that whole armor of God. Well, as we move into this section, chapter 6, we, we see that Nehemiah exposes what I think are some of the most sophisticated tricks of the evil one. And he teaches us how to overcome those. And only when we understand these tactics are we able to be successful uh, and continue in our journey. So let's look at those three tactics that the evil one uses to derail our journeys. The first one is this. If you're a note taker, which I hope you are. Number one, Satan uses compromise. Satan uses compromise. We see this in the very first four verses. Notice what happens. It says, when Sambalat and Tobiah, these guys have been after Nehemiah and the people of God since the very beginning of chapter 1. Same guys. It says, when they heard, uh, and, and uh, Geshem the Arab and the rest of the enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the, in, in the gates, Sambalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakaprim. <laughs> How was that? Was that good, Sheila? All right, that was good. Uh, in the plain of Ono, but they, that's a great name for a plain Ono, and they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. I love that. If you highlight in your Bible, highlight that verse. I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. In other words, I'm focused on what God has me to do. I can't stop this now. He said, I can't come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I, learned, and I answered them in the same manner. So we see in those first four verses, the closer we get to completing or being what God has called us to be, the, the more intense, the more sophisticated the schemes or the trickery or the methods of the evil one become. So we need to think about uh, as we get close to arriving. In other words, man, we've really been walking close with Christ. We can feel our personal walk going to another level. And it's at that point where we really need to be aware that, that the devil is... is you know, he's not just quit. He's backed off, and he's getting ready to come at us again. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands heed lest he fall. So, in other words, when you think you have got it whipped, it's at that moment, what? That you become vulnerable. So, in your Christian walk, you never arrive where the battle is over. Because as long as you're bringing glory to Christ, this is one of those nuggets that's not even in my notes. The, long, the longer and the more you bring glory to Christ, the more intense he's going to be at you. So in other words, if your life really isn't reflecting Christ, if you're really not pointing others to Christ, if you're not a light, if you're not salt, man, you probably don't even know the devil exists. If, if we're not living a Christian life, if we're not living at that higher plane, if we're not loving with, with the love of Christ and we're not uh, showing compassion that Christ has, if we're just sort of coming to church and, man, we're not killed anybody this week, we, we haven't gone to jail this week, and, you know, maybe we go to work and maybe we're a hard worker, if we're just a good citizen, man, the devil doesn't care about that. He's going to leave you alone. But the moment your life really starts to point others to Christ, the moment you begin to live for Christ, the moment where Christ becomes your priority above anything this world has to offer, it's at that moment that you're going to be in his scope. You're going to be on his radar. You're going to become his target. 
And so Sambalat and, and his cronies, they're getting desperate because the only thing left to do, Nehemiah just told us, is to set the doors and the gates. That's the only thing left. The wall's just about done. And as you look at the other chapters, the tactics of intimidation, they've already failed. The tactics of discouragement, they've already failed. So now the, the devil has to come at Nehemiah in a different direction. He's trying something new. And so we see it in the form here of they ask Nehemiah for this meeting. Meeting on the plain of Ona. Now Ona's about 20 miles northwest of, of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah knows if they can get him there, they're not just going to have tea with him and break bread and have a cake and celebrate. No, if, he can get, if they can get him there, they're going to do what? They're going to ambush him. I mean, they're going to jump him. That's their point. And so he says, you know, they intended to do what? In verse 2, they intended to do harm to me. I know this is an incordial visit. So Nehemiah's reply is one that we need to read carefully. I told you to highlight it already. He sends his messengers back to them. And in verse 3, he says to tell them that he's doing a great work and I can't go now. That's what he says. Nehemiah knows that there's no need to even talk about it. There's no need to talk about stopping that he's doing. He's finally got it going. He's accomplishing what God has called him to accomplish. There's no way that he's going to be stepping away from that. And what they're asking him to do at this point is to compromise the priority of building that wall. That's sort of the third level of attack that we see. And, you know, if we're doing our best, what God has called us to do and be, and he, he can't stop us through fear. He can't stop us through discouragement. Uh, the next tactic that comes our way is compromise. He might say it this way. Just lower your standards just a little bit and, and so we can work something out. Lower your standards a little bit. Come on down off of that wall. Come on down off of that journey that you're with with Christ. Let's talk about this and, and let's, let's seek to lower the bar a little bit. You know, one of my favorite stories where I see this is, is the story of the, of, of the guy that has the conversation with, with, with Jesus about how to get to heaven. And, and you remember the scripture says he wanted to, to uh, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? He wanted to... Uh, I want to use a different word. It's not coming. He wanted to justify. There we go. He wanted to justify himself before God. So he seeked to lower the standard. God, the, the, Christ had told him, you know, the Lord has said to get to heaven, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Uh, you know, and, and to love that way and to, and to love God with everything and to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, then you enter into heaven. And the guy recognized that he didn't do that. Just like you and I recognize, we don't do that all the time. So the guys seek to lower the standard a little bit. You remember the conversation? He asked this pointed question. Who is my what? Neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. The guy's looking, let's lower the bar. Let's define who my neighbor is. Let me just love those that I like. Let me just love those that are like me. So you see, that's what happens when we're walking with Christ and he seeks to bring us to that point of, of compromise. He, he asks us to come down and then draw our focus of what we are doing, what we are serving, and what Christ is doing into our life. And he asks us just for a moment to step away and to begin to compromise and lower the standards just a little bit. So in our lives, the evil one says, come down. And when he does, we're being tempted to compromise a truth that we need to be aware of in Proverbs 25. Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. So we need to keep our focus where? On Christ and what Christ is doing in our life and what Christ is doing in and through us. Because when we compromise on God's word, and we compromise on the mission, and we compromise on living for him, then what we're actually doing is we're dimming our lights. We're, we're corrupting our salt before a world. 
We're damaging our influence. And that temptation for Nehemiah to compromise, it, 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 it persists because he said, they sent the guy to me how many times? Messengers how many times? Four times. Not just one time and it's over. Four times. Persistent attack. Offering opportunities for him to compromise. And when the devil tempts us to compromise, we just simply need to say what Nehemiah said. No thanks. What I'm involved in right now is too important to leave. And listen, folks, as we leave today and as you're challenged to live for Christ, there's going to be opportunities outside of these doors, maybe before you even get outside of these doors, for you to compromise on what you know Christ has called you to be and to do. And the challenge from God's Word is to not lower that standard any way, any shape, or any form. So we see compromise, and when the evil one seeks to use compromise and that fails, it goes a little further. Look at verse 9. We're going to see that Satan not only seeks to use compromise, but he uses slander. He uses slander. Look at verse 5. In the same way, Sam Bellet for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That's why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to be their king. And you also have set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us counsel together. So he, he, he sends a fifth time the messenger and he says, I understand what you're hearing. What we're hearing is you guys are trying to rebel against the king. And then look at verse 8. Then I sent to him saying, no such thing as you say has been done. You are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. So man, in, in chapter 9, we see that Sambalat sends uh, Nehemiah the, uh, the same invitation a fifth time. But he adds to it this time, not just come and meet. But, but he adds to it that the surrounding nations believe that he and the Jews are plotting this revolt against the king. And Nehemiah is going to set himself up as what? As the king. And, and then he tells Nehemiah, this rumor, you, you know, we can't stop it. It's going to get back to the king. You know how things happen. Somebody's going to tell him. <laughs> you know who's going to tell him, right? I don't have to tell you that. This rumor is going to get back to the king, so we really need to talk. We really need to figure this thing out. Nehemiah, this is really for your own good. Because, sweet Nehemiah, you're a great guy. I don't want anything to happen to you. And Lord, help if, 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 if the king should hear about this. We, we want to contain this right out here in our little area. I'm really concerned about you, Nehemiah. Folks are saying a lot of things. I, that's a preacher joke there. I've heard those before. People are saying some things. Now, nobody had said this but Sam Bellet and Tobiah. But people are talking is what he's saying here. So if compromise doesn't work, the tactics then become even severe where it gets to the point where there's personal attack. There's slander in our lives. The evil one would begin to spread rumors that are designed to misrepresent our motives and our, our living for Christ. And it happens all around us as we seek to live for him. Not only can they be difficult to endure, they're, they're difficult to hear, and there's something about us when we hear those things that are said about us that aren't true. There's a natural reaction in us. We still have some flesh in us. There's some natural reaction in us that want to do what? They want to lash out. But, you know, Jesus knew that we would have to endure those things. Uh, and, and, and listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, <laughs> the crazy economy of the spiritual world. In our world, if someone slanders you, man, you get mad as a hornet. You get in your truck, you go to their house, and you take...
care of business. That's what we do, right? But in the spiritual world, when Christ lives inside of us, he tells us when people begin to slander you and you're living for me, what are you to do? Rejoice. I don't know about you, but that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Rejoice. When someone's talking bad about you, rejoice. When someone's sharing rumors about you, rejoice. When someone's trying to destroy everything that you've been praying for and working for and serving for and giving for, rejoice. That's absurd. But that's the spiritual response. That's the response that shows the presence of Christ. That's the response that brings glory and honor to Him. And listen, we can only do that when our nature's been changed. We can only do that when Christ is in us. So one of the great ways to tell that Christ is present in our life is if our nature has been changed. That we were this, but now we're this new creation. We're not just a shack that somebody's put vital siding over and we look great. We're something that's been built new from the ground up. We have a new nature in us. I heard an old boy say it this week. You know, you can take a pig and you can put him in a silk suit and you can dress him up and you can get him clean and you can bring him in the house. But the moment he walks by a mud hole, what's he going to do? He's going to jump in because he may be dressed up, but his nature hasn't changed. He's still a pig. And the reason Christ says rejoice when you're living for me and people slander you and people talk about you and, and, and people oppose you, your nature's been changed. You don't respond the way you used to would That's a Hardin County word. Used to would You respond in a way that brings glory to Christ. So rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great where? In heaven. That's an awesome word from Christ. So the devil spreads rumors like, oh, now you're going to church and, and now you don't do these things and now you're so much better than everyone else and, 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 or, or how are you different now? You used to do all of these things and they start talking about you. Oh, Mr. Goody Goody or, or whatever you want to say. You need to know and understand what those are. Those are moments when the devil is living up to his name. We don't hear much talk about the devil, but the devil is derived from a Greek word that means accuser or slanderer. So one of his most effective weapons is to use others to discourage you. Because by and large... Good folks really care what people think about them, don't we? We really care what people say about us. And he knows that about us. And when we try to live for God, the devil will live up to his name by accusing us, slandering us, and he has one purpose in mind. It's not that he cares anything about you. It's not that you're on his radar, but what's on his radar are others being pointed to Christ. So in this whole world, there's this huge battle between good and evil, and you and I are caught up in the battle. And so those people that slander you, it, it's, it's not personal about you. There's a bigger battle going on. And I want to suggest to you that we need to be mindful of that bigger battle that's happening. Because when we're mindful of that bigger battle, we don't take those smaller battles quite as personally. You know, the Bible tells us we don't battle against each other. We battle against what? Powers and principalities of darkness. So it's bigger than us. And so Nehemiah again prays to the Lord. And, and man, look at verse 9. You see his prayer. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands would drop from the work. 
And it will not be done. Those that begin to slander you, those that begin to talk about what you used to be and what you used would, would do, and now you're not doing those things and they're ridiculing you. What they're trying to get you to do is drop your hands from what you're presently doing. And so Nehemiah says, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get us to drop our hands from the work. Because if we drop our hands from the work, the work won't we be done. But what's Nehemiah's prayer? But now, O oh God, do what? Strengthen my hands. I love that prayer. I got to confess to you, Nehemiah might be a whole lot superior to me in spiritual walk. Because I might have been praying, you know, Lord, take care of my enemies. I might have been like the psalmist, wipe them all out. But Nehemiah doesn't pray Against them, he prays for himself and God's people. Lord, strengthen my hands. You know, Satan knows that the rumors will quickly spread throughout Jerusalem and they'll finally make their way to the king because most people, you know, most people will repeat any juicy story without checking it out, won't they? That's just our human nature. You know, somebody spills the tea there's always somebody there to clean it up and move it on down the line. That's just a part of us that we enjoy. Every, almost everybody loves to share a little bit of breaking news. And we got it. This is not in the notes, but we need to just put a little disclaimer in there. We need to make sure we as Christ people aren't the one that are involved in that slandering. We don't need to be vessels that these stories move through. And there's a great principle that I read years ago, and I can't remember who wrote it or I'd give credit. It says, before repeating any story, we can ask ourselves two questions. Number one, is it true? And number two, is it helpful? Then before it's saying anything else, we should remember what we read in Ephesians 4. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may bring grace to those who hear. So be careful when we hear those stories and, and, and we, some, listen, let's just real talk. I've been in Baptist churches for a long time. Sometimes we even guise our slander as prayer requests. I mean, we baptize it a little bit, put a robe on it, but it's still slander. And so we have to ask ourselves, is this thing true and is it helpful for me to share this? Because we, want to be, we don't want to be found guilty of letting that corrupt talk come out of our mouths. Only those things that what? That build up. So, notice what happens here in the story. There's been compromise. There's been slander. When that don't work, it gets to number three. Satan uses diversion. Satan uses diversion. Look at verse 10. Now I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delilah, the son of Mahuathobel. I should have got somebody to read this for me. Who was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple for they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you by night. Then verse 11. But I said, should, should, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I Go into the temple and live. I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way in sin, so that he could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember, Tobiah and Sambalat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophecies, no Adda, not even close. And the rest of the prophets, prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elo, the 50 and 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judea, of Judah, sent many letters to Tobiah and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, and because he was the son-in-law of Shekaniah, the son of Era, and his son Jehoan, <laughs> man, that's rough, had given the daughter of, you know, this guy, the son of his wife, 
Now, let's look at verse 19 and wrap this up because it's getting really bad. And they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him, and Tobias sent letters to make me afraid. Now, notice what happens next. He, he, he tried the compromise. He, he tried the slander. And, and now he moves to this derision. You know, Nehemiah's next problem came through this hired guy that, that, that Tobiah and Sambalat hired. Uh, he, he's posing as a prophet, and he suggests to Nehemiah that they have this meeting in the temple because some men are trying to kill you. Nehemiah, let's meet in the temple because there's folks that are after you. They're going to kill you. They're going to come by night and kill you. And Nehemiah refuses to do this because he recognizes immediately that this man had been hired to do this. So we see in these verses that Satan's trying to divert Nehemiah by getting him to forget the wall and to hide in the temple. And Nehemiah knows he will be sinning if he does that, if he goes into the temple, because the law of Moses forbid anyone except priests to be in the temple. The, in Numbers chapter 3, 2 Chronicles, tell us that. And, and so, the intensity has picked up. There's a man posing as a preacher comes to him and says, man, they're trying to kill you. Let's duck into the church. Let's go into this sanctuary here and let's, let's hide out because they're going to kill you by night. But what we learn from Nehemiah is this. When someone advises you to do something that's clearly contrary to God's word, we really, really need to be aware of our next step. And, and that's true if he's, if he's a preacher. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter who he is. It doesn't matter where he says it from. That there's nobody in this place that respects and honors this place of proclaiming God's word. But if there's someone here that stands here and, and suggests you do something that's contrary to God's word, you need to be discerning. You need to be in the word yourself. You need to be aware. And, and we need to... Pay close attention to our next step. You know, even if it wasn't forbidden for, for Laman to enter the temple at this point, if Nehemiah hides in fear, then his leadership is going to be undermined and the morale of the people is going to drop. And, and Nehemiah knows that this man is not a prophet from God. He tells us that in verse 12. And though he's, he's never read it, Nehemiah really understands the truth that's found in 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself, listen to this, as an angel of light. Even Satan himself, when he gets desperate, he disguises himself as an angel of light. You know, the evil one derails a lot of believers by getting them to follow the advice of people who claim to be Christians or preachers or teachers, but they're misinformed messengers that have been sent by the evil one. Because diversion is one of his primary tactics. Now let's just talk about that for a moment. Diversion means to be diverted away from something. So in my individual walk, that means Satan's going to be, when I'm, man, when, I'm, when I'm living for Christ and, man, I'm studying God's Word and, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm in God's Word and I'm spending time in prayer and I'm living for Him and I'm telling people about Him, it's at that moment that I need to be paying close attention because there's going to be little things put in my pathway that He wants to use to divert me away from this, divert me away from those things that I know I should be doing. And in our culture, one of the primary ways is busyness. I mean, let's be honest. We, we got microwaves. We got drive through everything to speed up our lives, to save us time. But we're busier than we've ever been. 
Our lives are running recklessly from here to there, from here to there. And what we often find ourselves doing is giving God the little bit that's left over after we fulfill this obligation and this obligation and this obligation and these obligations. And then we give God the little bit that's left. We need to know and understand what busyness is. It's a diversion from Christ. And just think about the people that honestly think in our culture now, maybe they're in your family, they're in my family, that they really just don't have time to fit God into their lives right now because they're so busy. And if we don't think that our adversary is just stepping back and say, you know what, I've got them. I've got them. They're diverted from living for Christ. They're diverted from being sold out to Christ. Their, their lives are chasing, they're chasing money. They're chasing fame. They're chasing notoriety. They're chasing those things that they think are going to give them hope and peace and fulfillment in life. But they're diverted now away from the thing that offers all of that, the person of Jesus Christ. I can just leave them now to themselves and I can go over here and begin attacking here because that front's already won. And man, it's sad to see that happen in individuals' lives. But you know, I told you at the very beginning, not, not, not only can we apply that individually, but we must understand that corporately. But we got to understand that as the body of Christ, that there are things that are coming our way when we as a body of Christ are seeking to make a turn and really be on mission for Christ and really begin to live for him and really begin to make disciples. We need to be aware of things that are coming into our life together that could potentially divert us away from that mission. And man, there are countless, there are too many to name. From policies and procedures and buildings and grounds and funds and all of these things. If we're not careful, we will begin amongst ourselves giving so much attention to those things that we are diverted away from the main thing as the body of Christ. And man, I want to serve you well as your interim pastor. You're standing right at the edge. You're standing right, right at the edge where you guys are, are, are at that, that, that the point of stepping into a, a new future for this church. And I just believe that God has great plans for you. And I believe there are people that are in this body that want to reach this community. And I'm committed that there's folks in here that want to impact this world. But for me to serve you well, I just have to say to you as your interim pastor, you need to be aware there's going to be opportunity for you to be diverted don't let it happen don't let it happen don't allow yourself to be consumed with conversation and things that as Sheila's already said to us one day are all going to be gone let your focus be the person of Christ and the mission of God let your decisions be bathed in prayer about how can we bring the most glory to God? How can we honor Him? And let us walk together in righteousness and allow our preferences to drop off of us so that we resemble Christ more and more. I'm telling you, on the authority of God's Word, man, you start... Heading towards that mission of God. The evil one's going to put the potential for you to be drawn away. I see it every day. You know, they say statistically over 95%, probably realistically, probably 98% of our churches in North Carolina are plateaued or declining in need of revitalization. 
and most all of those is not because God left their church. It's not because God decided, I didn't want to do anything here. It's because at some point in their history, they were diverted away from the main thing. And when that happens, the church drifts further and further apart, but it also drifts further and further from God. The only thing, the only thing that you can unite a group of people like us is the mission of Christ. Because all of us have different experiences that we bring into this room. All of us has different backgrounds. All of us have different preferences. Some like red. Some like light blue. Some like dark blue. Some crazy folk like orange. The only thing that you can unite us is the mission of God. So I plead with you. Expect those opportunities to be diverted. And when they come, look over those and look to Christ. And ask the question, how can we bring the most glory to Him? How can we fulfill the mission that He has for us? Fathers, we come today, Lord, we're honored to be called your people Lord, we recognize, Lord, that as we seek to live for you individually and corporately, uh, Lord, that there is an adversary that seeks to devour us. And so, Lord, you remind us that when those things come into our life, whether it's compromise, whether it's, whether it's slander, whether it's diversion, Lord, when those things come into our life, Lord, that, that we should rejoice because that means our focus is right. That means that you're getting the glory and the honor. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, if there's one in this room today, Lord, that they just surrender their life to you, that, uh, Lord, they just have been trying, Lord, within their own power, uh, Lord, to live a, a good Christian life. But, Lord, today, Lord, maybe they recognize they just need to surrender to you. And, Lord, allow your spirit to set up residence in their life and, Lord, just change their nature. Because as we've seen, even from today's scripture, it's impossible for us to live to the standard that you require of us, Lord, without our natures being changed. Because it seems foolish to rejoice when we're being slandered. But Lord, when our nature is changed, uh, Lord, we have a joy and a peace and a sense of rejoicing, even in the midst of that difficulty. And Lord, I just pray for this congregation, Lord, as we're standing, Lord, right at that edge of a new future, a new direction, Lord, the excitement of a a new pastor and his lovely wife being here and, Lord, having a new vision and, and, and connection with this community and the world. Lord, we know and understand there's going to be opportunities for our attention to be diverted. And Lord, let us each fight that battle individually. Lord, let us keep that main focus, the main focus, and keep our eyes upon you. And Lord, maybe today, right where we're standing or right at this altar, Lord, maybe we just want to come to you as the body of Christ today, Lord, and just say, Lord, give me that ability to keep my eyes and my focus upon you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we stand.